Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Corey Rosen, and you are listening to the Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest, Mr. Miss. Doctor. Uh, Mr. Doctor. 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 <laughs> That's even better. Dr. <laughs> Mariah Thompson Corley, BM of University of Alberta, MMDMA, the Juilliard School, once born in Jamaica and raised in Canada. She has performed internationally as both a solo and collaborative artist at venues including the Smithsonian Muse- Museum of African American History, Epidaurus Festival, List Academy, Carnegie Recital Hall, and Aaron Davis Hall. Among her collaborators are the Mel- Metropolitan Opera Soprano Priscilla Baskerville, Juno Award winning clarinetist James Campbell, Grammy Award winning clarinetist Doris Hogalotti, a friend of the show. Grammy nominated baritone Randall Scarlatta, renowned countertenor Daryl Taylor, and members of the New York Philharmonic and Philadelphia Orchestras. Maria, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. Yeah. So, you were born in Jamaica, raised in Canada. Where did music fall into your life? Oh, um, from the very beginning, I would say, um, you know, my grandmother was a graduate of the New England Conservatory as a piano major, piano performance major. Um, That's the Bermuda side of my family, my mom's side. And uh, my mom was a piano teacher and she taught each of her kids. So I had uh, an older brother who was studying, first of all, and I guess from the time I was two, I wanted to learn to play. So um, she made me wait till I was four. And then I've been playing the piano ever since. So was it, how did you, did you start writing immediately or did you take lessons or? Um, in composition, uh, that, uh, I took a year of composition when I was about 14, 13, 14. Hmm. And um, that's my only formal compositional training. Um, but I was writing little pieces. Um, I remembered later that my brother, who was um, an actor and dir- uh, aspiring director, very talented, um, would make Super 8 movies. And so he would ask me to do the film scores, like to come up with music to go uh, or find music, you know, like we'd play sometimes records that I thought the music fit a certain scene. So I was doing that from, I think, before, certainly before puberty. <laughs> so I don't know if I was 10 or 9 or something, but, you know, doing things like that. Um, and it's funny, I didn't think of myself as a composer until quite recently. It just seemed like, um, I don't know why it wasn't on my radar. It was, I mean, I don't know if it was because I hadn't uh, gotten a lot of training, but, you know, when I was a teenager, I was writing pop songs, which, you know, I didn't really know what to do with to put them anywhere. But um, so coming up with melodies and, and uh, musical ideas was never difficult. But I um, I started arranging, first of all, um, and this was just for fun. Um, friends, uh, we had all gone to college and came back for Christmas, and my mom was the uh, music director and organist at um, the church where I, I grew, up, grew up going. And so um, I came up with this idea of arranging in the bleak midwinter for us to do as an a cappella, um, sort of in the style of Take Six. Mm. And um, that's the first arrangement that I can recall writing down, which interest, I think I was about 20, somewhere in the range of 20, 21. And... Um, Quite recently, a group called Musica Intima, um, based in Canada, discovered this uh, arrangement. You know, I, I, I didn't have a recording of it, but I guess they were looking for things by uh, Canadian composers or looking for new music. And so they're going to re- be releasing that on um, a recording for a Christmas or winter recording. And um, they're actually a Juno winning. Um, Juno is the Canadian Grammys. But when they reached oh. out about this, they hadn't won their Juno yet. But... Um, yeah, so that's going to give that piece and, I guess, me a little bit more cred in Canada. So that'll be cool. That's really cool. So what you were born in Jamaica. Do you remember anything of Jamaica, or is it all Canada for you? Uh, I don't remember being in – I mean, I've been back to Jamaica, but I left before I was two. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no real memories of it. But um, it's interesting the times that I have gone back. I don't know if this is just um, – yeah, it's kind of an immigrant thing, but um, there's a sense of home, even though I know that – I'm not really, you know, my cousins would say, like, you know, I'm not really a Jamaican. You know, if you don't grow up there, I um, would hesitate to try the accent unless I'd been there in a while and had it in my ear sort of thing because I just don't, you know, haven't had uh, that speech pattern. But um, there is something about 
the place that, you know, when I have gone there, it just kind of, there's this nugget of something in your heart that gets opened up or is awakened or it calls to you in some way. So like your first yeah. deepest memories that you have. Yeah, yeah. somewhere, somewhere. So yeah. you went up to Canada and now you're in the U.S. Right. How how that transition happen? Well, um, I wanted, you know, I got into Juilliard and then I... Let's talk, let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> that's a hard, that's a hard uh, accomplishment. Yeah, you know, um, my major piano teacher for most of the teacher I studied with the longest period of time, um, with, her name was Alexandra Munn, and she studied at Juilliard with Erwin Freundlich, and she would always mention Mr. Freundlich this and that. And so she just decided that I should go to Juilliard. Now, I... Uh, I guess I was fairly ignorant. I had a lot of different interests. So I wasn't really a piano geek necessarily. Like there are a lot of things I like to do and listen to and stuff. So, and you know, you didn't just Google stuff back then because it was way back in the day. So I didn't realize how hard it was to get into Juilliard. So um, yeah, so it was like, well, you must go to Juilliard. So that's the only place I auditioned. And the first the time- only place. That's the only place I auditioned. And the, the, wow. after I did my undergrad at the University of Alberta with, with her as my teacher as well but for graduate school. So the first time I didn't get in and I was like, oh, wait, what? I thought I was going to Juilliard. Um, but um, the teacher um, she'd picked out for me, because again, it was like, I was just like, okay, whatever you say. Um, um, George Shondor um, uh, was interested in taking me as a, a private student and I got a grant from the Canadian government, a Canada Council grant that allowed me to, I, want, I moved to Toronto from Leduc, Alberta. I was happy to get out of the small town and go to the big city. And um, I flew down every other week for about a year, and I auditioned again. I got in. And then when it was time for me, well, it wasn't necessarily time for me to get a doctorate, but um, having finished the master's, um, you know, I was urged to go on and, and continue. And, you know, um, I was a good student. And, you know, I, mean, I think my parents were thinking, like, you're in music. You should have more bases covered here. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but again, I only auditioned for Juilliard for the doctoral program. And my thought back then in my youth was, well, if I don't get in, then that means I wasn't meant to get a doctorate. And if I do get in, then that means I was. So um, I was, I think, more relaxed than for any audition. I'm not someone who enjoys auditioning or, uh, you know, and uh, those sorts of things, like, they can freak me out as opposed to, if you're playing and just sharing with people as opposed to like competing in some way, you know, that, um, so, um, anyway, so I got in and I, I was just completely like, okay, I guess I'm doing a doctorate. But when I look back now, I think it was better that I didn't think, oh, wow, this is going to be super hard to get in, you know, that I was just like, okay, I'm just going to go play and, you know, see what happens. Yeah. But it was a bad, I would never, at, um, advocate that sort of attitude because I think, mm. There's so many great schools in that area. If you're going to be flying to the New York area, you should audition at a bunch of places. Oh, so, absolutely. yeah, nobody else, don't follow my lead. That was dumb. <laughs> but, it, I mean, I, I got a year off. I loved to, uh, being in Toronto and having a year in between my studies. I was a little bit burnt out. I mean, I was someone who always was super gung-ho about doing, you know, absolutely the best that I could in everything, which is good. But then... Yeah, I was just tired by the time I got to the end of my undergrad. So it was good for me to have a year off, and it was good for me to also realize, like, okay, you know, I I think I really do want to go back and do this seriously and just have renewed vigor about, yeah, yeah, this isn't something that I'm ready to stop the journey of learning more and, you know, exploring it. So so tell me a little bit about uh, Juilliard. What were some of the challenges that you faced there? Was it was it as easy as you maybe have thought of, or what was, like... Oh, no, I didn't think it was going to be easy to be at Juilliard I just didn't realize how hard it was to get in I see. yeah um so I mean I was in a very very small minority I was the only black pianist for most of the time and I um kept in touch with a um his name is Major Skurlock he came in uh when I was already working on my dissertation um and you know but I asked him like not that long ago because he was in uh, teaching in the pre-college division have you seen any other black female pianists at Juilliard in all this time and he hadn't so I thought that was really kind of bizarre. But, I mean, I had, um, and maybe it was mo mostly in my own head, but, you know, when I first was there and practicing in the practice rooms, I would see people sort of peeking in the in the practice room kind of, I don't know if they were scoping me out because it wasn't like any, someone knocked on the door and said, hey, welcome to Juilliard. They were just kind of like, you know, looking and listening, very um, competitive sort of thing. 
Um, but um, that was the sort of thing. I was like, you know, are people looking at me as a representative of like, can black people play the piano at this level? Mm. And um, so that was maybe the first year that I was a little intimidated. The second year, I was able to realize that, okay, I'm here and they're here. So we're all here. And it doesn't really matter, like, what they are thinking. I can't control that. All I can do is try to learn as much as I can and grow as much as I can. Stay on your track. Right, exactly. I can't carry the weight of an entire race of people on my back in the sense of, you know, if I'm really good, then all black people are good. And if I'm not good, then all black people aren't good. That makes no sense. No. So I, you know, got that thought out of my head, you know, and um, kept going. But people assumed I was a singer or a dancer, I think, just because that was where most of the black people were who were at Juilliard. And there weren't very many of us. So that was, um, that was a, a thing. That was, yeah, to me, my biggest challenge was just my own getting out of my own way and trying to navigate and get rid of the negative thoughts that just made it more stressful you know absolutely it's 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 one thing to think about what other people think but as long as you're in your own mind and stay within your own mind Mm -hmm. things get a lot easier they do i mean obviously when we're in music there's i mean there's comparison and of course you know but but i think yeah you can really lose sight of um what you're there to do which is it should be to grow and to learn and to do the best that you can to channel that music and use what gift that you have been given to the best of your ability so and you have used that gift in many many ways tell me uh, you have a a number of achievements here on on your bio working for uh, like access which is like uh, especially here this is where we all went to listen to all the you know the famous recordings of classical composers Mm -hmm. what how did those opportunities come about? You've worked with different, uh, the New York Philharmonic and Philadelphia orchestras. Where uh, does this all? Well, I mean, the people who I've met uh, to collaborate with, um, I don't know. I mean, they just kind of came. I mean, when I moved to Lancaster, um, nobody knew me, and I had little kids, and um, I, I'm not sure how I found out about the Lancaster Conservatory, but. Um, or maybe it was because my uh, my ex husband was teaching at Millersville, and I that I think that's where I, my introduction came. He was teaching there, and then he said, "You know, my wife is a pianist. Do you think that there's some use that you could find for her?" And then you know, s- submitted recordings and stuff. And I said, "Oh yeah, we can find some use for her." So I think it was it was I guess through the Millersville community, and then um, you know, just having opportunities to to play here and there, and people hearing me or whatever. Um, the the Philadelphia Orchestra, um, uh, it was because of um, oh, Donna Burkholder, her daughter, is a violinist who I, mm. I assume is still playing there. And so I knew Donna Burkholder, and that's how I got connected with her daughter. And um, then also um, New York Phil is um, my friend Sarah Male, who, with whom I've collaborated a number of times. And she and I and Doris have also played together. Um, her husband plays viola in the New York Phil. So that was how I was connected. Um, but, I mean, uh, while I will say that a lot of music I discovered is marketing, <laughs> you know, I mean, like putting things out there, um, whether it's, you know, YouTube videos or finding churches or organizations that have concert series and trying to interest them in having you do things. Um, you know, I've gotten a fair amount of things from you know, whatever I put out there and someone telling somebody or hearing me and, you know, but yeah, that was, that was a thing that they didn't really stress when I was at Juilliard. I think now they do more of that, which Mm -hmm. is that, okay, so you're going to have to find a venue and put on your own concert and do some marketing for yourself and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think that's a much more realistic view other than just, okay, well, go into your practice room and play really well and everything will fall into place because that definitely, or win a competition you know, go the competition route and, you know, I mean, yeah, for some people, but for a lot of us, not really. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. A part of the, being a musician is being a business person as well. Absolutely. Because if you can be great at music, but if no one hears about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and anything that involves an aspect of freelance, that's the whole thing. You have to be prepared for the um, parts that are unpredictable. 
you know, financially unpredictable. <laughs> I mean, I've had a, a job at St. Thomas Episcopal Church for longer than I should probably care to admit. But, you know, it's been about not care to admit, but it just seems like the time has gone by. And I look at the number, I'm like, oh, my goodness, like 20 years, you know, and um, having that anchor both as a, um, you know, spiritually and as a family atmosphere, like it's a, it's, I know some people have had bad experiences working in churches. Anytime you get a bunch of people together, anything can happen. Right, but, um, you know, but my experience has been almost uh, completely just wonderful. And um, it's been something that, yeah, definitely was an anchor. I, I don't know. I mean, I suppose some people have a, a large teaching studio or whatever, but it's really hard to have just, okay, I'm a performer and, you know, especially with kids. Mm. Yeah. Is that something you uh, want to move into as more of like a teaching role or for with kids? Or? Oh, um, well, I meant with having kids. Oh, I see. Having of course, yes. Kids. Yeah, I've, I've taught since I was 13 years old, which is kind of insane. That is kind of insane. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I was, I, I went rather quickly at the beginning, so I was quite a bit more advanced than the beginners I was teaching, and I was tall. And, you know, my mom is was a music teacher and she would, you know, sort of sit outside or listen in on the lessons and stuff like that. Mm. But, um, and, you know, as far as jobs go, I suppose when you're 13, there aren't too many jobs that you can do, really. Not, really. <laughs> you know, but I mean, when I look back on it now, I can't imagine having a 13 year old teaching even my beginning kid, but I've, I've done it continuously ever since. So, what are some things that you've learned about teaching that, uh, because on one side you are being a teacher, but on the other side you've been taught by high level musicians. What are what are some things that you would like to translate from those high level teachings into maybe the average studio teacher here in Lancaster? Um, well, I don't know that I want to tell people how how they should be teaching, but oh, of course. I mean I do think that um, so much there's so much psychology. You know, mm. I mean like just trying to find out what a particular student is going to relate to, and um, you know, I, I found that the more um, the more technique that I uh, acquired, the more that, you know, I could try to look for certain things, you know, early on. I mean, it's hard to absolutely, especially when kids are not sure they're really committed. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's only so much you can do. I mean, there are things that, you know, I'll, I'll tell them, okay, this may not seem to matter now, but, you know. But I mean, I mean, the basic thing is that you play the piano with your fingers. So what you do with your hands, your fingers, arms, everything um, can affect how easy or difficult it is, which is something that you may not notice at the beginning. But um, yeah, I mean, I hope that um, in addition to having a bar set for themselves that allows them to feel like they have achieved some sort of mastery, you know, like um, that they do continue to feel or, or learn to have a love of music as a self-expression. Like you talk, your thing's called the story. I mean, like the idea of being able to tell a story in music, you know, and, you know, why do we play things loud or soft? Why do we want to um, try to... Um, compel people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when then compel yourself, first of all, like, you know, find out. You know, it's not just I'm playing the notes in rhythm, mm -hmm. you know. And But if I learn to play the notes in rhythm, then I can do something really cool. So, um, you know, step one, step two, and try to incorporate them as much as possible. But, yeah, as I said, each kid is a is its own, is his own <laughs> puzzle. So do you, do you teach as well? Or? Uh, I teach children how to swim. Yes. Oh, okay. So it's a whole, yeah. whole extra layer to that one. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But it's a lot of fun. And, and you know. The main thing I would say is to make sure you're always encouraging. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I will always try to find something good to say about what they did, even if it's that they, I, that I know they can do better because I've seen them. You know, I know what you can oh, do. Yeah. So making sure because some, sometimes they'll they'll be a little bit sneaky and try to try to feign ignorance and like, no, I've seen you do this before. You you can do that. Right, or, right. You know, or that, they get a little yeah hesitant about it. Or or that week, you know, I mean, I'll ask. You know, is everything okay? Like, was it a really busy week? Mm -hmm. Like, you come in and it's clear you haven't really done anything. So I'll start with that and then, you know, go with, well, you know, I've seen what you can do. So I know that, you know, I'm only asking you to do this because I know you can. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, know that I believe in them. Yeah. So we have one of your pieces that I'd love to get to. This is one mm -hmm. of the first pieces you you were written at, at 14-year-olds. Would you like to elaborate on it? Yeah. <clears throat> 
so recess um i wrote a set called um nautical glimpses which was n-a-u-g-h-t-y kel glimpses tales of a kindergarten class and uh that was um kind of my final assignment or something with my year of composition and um so these are supposed to be scenes as it says from a kindergarten class um these four different little vignettes so i think this piece lasts about a minute yeah so what is this piece trying to elaborate on do you think uh, kids, little kids running around in the playground, maybe teasing each other. And then at the end, there's something that's supposed to sound like a bell calling them in. And then they all just run back into the building. Oh, let's see what you can imagine with this piece. I guess that never goes out of style, does it? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. And uh, so there's four four other pieces of that. Well, there's three others. Three um, other, the first right. one is the Early Morning March, which um, I ha- was assigned to write something in the style of Prokofiev. So to me, it's supposed to sound like trudging through the snow first thing in the morning. I wasn't mm. like a morning person. And after growing up in Western Canada, there was some trudging through the snow. <laughs> I'm sure. uh, yeah. And then the second one um, is... Um, that one and then no wait which was what's the order i should remember um then teacher tells a mythical tale is is the third one i believe and that mm. one is um you know meant to be sort of once upon a time sounding and a little bit slower and um mystical and then the last one is skipping home so mm. yeah that's so interesting at 14 you're, you're employing a lot of uh contemporary music compositional stuff it's not much classical at all it's just more of uh what is it called post postmodern theory a little bit maybe i don't know that i was thinking of that well of course right <laughs> it, um, but it, it's still so interesting how it, how it, it flows it makes sense as, as a piece it's it's like uh i'm literally forgetting all of the composers and all of my history mm-hmm. but it's very much it's very much of that uh contemporary style where it's 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 not very classical uh, but it's it's programmatic. It makes sense, and it flows correctly, even though you're not following the rules. Well, I mean, I think the rules. Like, what are the rules? I mean, like, <laughs> right, you right, know, because right. I mean, like, sonata form. Okay, people were writing a certain way, and someone said, "What are they doing?" Oh, let's break it down and call it sonata form. And then right. once you codified it, then everybody's breaking the rules. Right. That people are like, okay, well, this is sort of sonata form, but then it's kind of we're doing this. And, you know, so I think that um, and also the idea of being influenced by things like what is classical music? I mean, we're Mm -hmm. thinking Western European classical music is has is something that's always drawn from what was around. If you're talking about um, um, Bach, even in his suites and the dance forms that are in the suites, well, where will the dancers coming from? Right. From the classical music, well, no, these are things that people were doing that was m- the popular music of the right. time. You know, Hungarian Rhapsody, which he's, you know, trying to, uh, you know, fake um, Roma, the music of the Roman people or something. So I think I think that, um, I think we, you know, in trying to put barriers or definitions on this is jazzy, this is classical. I mean, it's not that your ears won't say, okay, this sounds more like classical music than hip hop, you know. But then people combi- have combined the two with of that as well. And you have operas and different things that draw on that. I mean, I, I've done that, you know. And so I, I don't know. I, I just feel like making these divisions, I think they're artificial. To me, if music speaks to me in some way, you know, if I have a, an emotional reaction to it, you know, I'm not thinking, well, I shouldn't like this because it's this category and I'm supposed right. to be a higher plane or something or you know, or that music is so pretentious, I shouldn't like it. Like, you know, sometimes 
I, I gave a talk um, a number of years ago um, at Christmas Addicts, and it was uh, contemporary music for urban kids. And the word urban is kind of used differently now. But back when I did it, that seemed like an appropriate thing to call it. And um, so, um, you know, I came in and this young man was like, are you going to rap? I said, no, nah, you don't want to hear me rap. So I, I played a number of different pieces. I played, I even chanced to play Schumann's Traumerei, which it was really warm. There was no air conditioning. So I think that was a really dangerous thing to do if I wanted my audience to stay awake. But um, I played a number of different pieces. And um, my point was that all emotion, all humans have emotions and how we express it, it's like different languages. So if I say I love you in French or I say it in Swahili or whatever the language is that I choose, it's just as valid an expression of emotion. So to me, music is the same way. So I was saying, you know, don't put yourself in a box because people tell you you should like this or like that. I mean, you don't have to like it. But I think that, you know, the idea that, well, I don't like this because I'm whoever I am or I should like it because I'm whoever I am. I, I think that's just, you know, allowing others who I said, really, most of the people that are your friends right now, and these are, you know, kids in grades in elementary school, I hate to tell you this, but a lot of these people you will just not even know. So to let those people determine what it is that you enjoy, I mean, I, I just don't think that's that makes a lot of sense. And so afterwards, a couple of kids came up to me and said, um, you know, I, I really like the Moonlight Sonata. You know, like <laughs> all quiet, you know, like you weren't supposed to let anybody know. But um, anyway. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you for sure. Mm -hmm. Don't let just because you're you're a rapper doesn't mean you can't like country music or you can't like whatever else. I mean, Whatever. it's like Nelly in uh, Florida Georgia Line. I'm not a I'm not a big country listener, so I don't know a lot of the people. But I'm aware of like, it doesn't make sense that there are whole categories of people to me who have no musical gifts. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like you know, in the if we go back to Western classical music, you know, like all these black composers who I'm now um, championing more. You know, recording um, music by black women. I mean, Florence Price died a long time ago her music is not better than it was before she died it's just that people are taking the time to listen to it and give her um you know and discover it and before it was just dismissed out of hand because of who she was um and i think that goes in in as i said all kinds of directions there are creativity is not confined to any one group and great creativity is not confined to any one group some people have more access to mm. training and whatever but um i don't think you know greatness is limited to any you know one group of people i would say uh, a great example of of a chameleon that kind of molds to a lot of different genres is elton john oh yeah because uh -huh. yeah, he, you know he's played with tupac he's played with when i first heard his, his uh, track with tupac i was like wait what? i've never heard it <laughs> no uh, I ghetto it gospel up. it's oh. called ghetto gospel and wow. uh, it's a track with tupac and when i first heard it i was like okay that's tupac i'm vibing and then I heard Elton John's voice. I'm like, wait, hold, hold on a second. So this was something while Tupac was alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I have to look at that. And I was, I was blown away. I was, there's wow. no way. And then you know he does stuff with Britney Spears now. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I heard that. And all these other different artists, and it's just like, wow, that's a range, and that's that's not caring. Yeah, and and I don't and I don't think you should. Oh, I mean, sure. you mentioned um, interviewing Snarky Puppy, and you mentioned that they had performed with Yo Yo Yo, Yo Ma, and I think he's someone who also has extended, mm -hmm. um, you know, to world music or whatever. Just you know, wanted to do different things outside of just the niche that he had carved for himself. And yeah, I think that that's that's great. I mean, you have one life to live. If you're a curious musician. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't it? Exactly yeah. right. And don't let other people hold you back for what you want to do. No. That's the way music progresses anyway. Exactly. Yep. We have some of your more recent work. We have uh, Lucid Dreaming. Okay. Would you like to talk about this? Yeah. Okay. So um, I mentioned that I um, recorded a recent um, album, if they call them albums anymore, of music by black women uh, for piano. And um, I had done one in 2006, uh, and I figured I'd probably never record another uh, CD or whatever because um, it's really expensive. Like, they don't pay you. <laughs> I mean, unless it's maybe you're project. super <laughs> famous. Absolutely. And so, but the thing was, um, I had no performances because of the pandemic, and I had all this music that I had bought and had never learned because, you know, I mean, you're trying to do some things that, like, I had projects and you have a concert coming up. And to learn something new that um, might be a little bit challenging, it's sort of like, well, I have to 
how much time do I have? Okay, well, maybe I won't learn that piece. Anyway, um, I went I went through those files, and somebody had reached out to me. His name was um, Jared Oakes, and um, he was familiar with another CD that I had done of music by Leslie Adams, who is an African-American composer. Yeah. And he uh, invited me to, um, you know, he said, if you need any help on a project, you know, I'll try to help you. Anyway, cutting to the chase, I decided to write a piece for myself since I was thinking mm. of myself as a composer, so I figured I should include some of my own music if I'm yes. going to record other people's music. So long introduction, lucid dreaming, because I used to have lucid dreams about flying. Sometimes it was difficult to fly, but, you know, uh, I, I would do that when I was much younger, and I loved to sleep. So that was the first topic I thought of, okay, let me write something about dreaming. <laughs> well, with that said, this is Lucid Dreaming by Mar- Maria, Maria. <laughs> Cor- <laughs> Thomas, Thomas and Corley. was lucid dreaming what a very unique piece i really <laughs> like that i really enjoyed that I, a lot actually thank you <laughs> of course so uh that was during the pandemic where you wrote that piece and uh speaking about pandemic where everything was shut down mm-hmm. what did you do uh as musicians because that is, was a very hard time for every musician it really was um on the other hand it i, I have to say there was a definite silver lining in my case because it gave me more time to compose and um, as I mentioned, like I've only recently thought of myself as a composer. And um, there were some people who asked for 
projects uh, that I didn't realize that you could make a good chunk of money <laughs> composing. <laughs> and um, it was, you know, and I wouldn't have asked for that much, but they said, you know, I, we can give you this much money and, you know, is that okay? And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's so, fine. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. That'll work. So um, the thing that I called almost my, my personal stimulus payment was um, this wonderful soprano named Taylor Jasmine. Um, um, sorry, I think it's Taylor Jasmine. Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, T- Jasmine, Taylor. Um, she she got in touch with me, and um, that's not her last name. I don't know why I'm blanking on her last name. Um, but anyway, she got in touch with me about writing for her master's recital. I guess she, you know, she was very much revered in that music department at Xavier. And so she, um, and so I, she sent me five of her favorite scriptural verses and wanted me to write this song cycle. And so um, I I was just very really grateful for the opportunity and the music really flowed and, and the money was very, very, very came in handy. <laughs> and um, so that was, you know, something where I really on the steps to really thinking, okay, yeah, I am a composer. Mm -hmm. She found me on YouTube. So, you know, that's back to the marketing thing. Like if you have stuff, record it and just put it out there. You never know who will find it. And um, so out of that um, came the cycle to meditate in his temple. And it's a a series of five pieces? It's a series of five five pieces, yeah. And they cover a number of styles. Um, One is meant to sound like old-time gospel. Um, The first one is a little bit more um, Baroque-sounding. Um, and um, then I have one that is has tinges of sort of contemporary gospel. She could sing a number of different styles. I mean, the way she she performed it was all kind of um, uh, more classically. Um, but and she had this really wide range, so that you know I was trying to show her off a bit. And then she was called her Chirara was really excellent, so I tried to get some of that in there. And then the last one, um, the Philippians uh, four Philippians six seven is. Um, more like a lullaby, and that's the one mm. I chose to end with because I felt like all of her texts were about things will be all right and you can trust that they will be so. And so um, I felt that that was an, a nice, uh, the best message to close with. And that's what we have for you here today, so let's take a listen to that.
And that was Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And the singer was Taylor Jasmine White. And the pianist was Aaron Matthews, Dr. Aaron Matthews. Very nice. So... And you, you've also done, so that was a commission piece, mm-hmm. and you've also done other commission pieces for a lot of other people. You, you've done a mini opera. You, uh, a couple of them, yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is something that you want to do, but you have yet to do? Um, well, I have a couple of projects in the queue, so to speak. I mean, I've been working on um, a piece about Representative John Lewis with... Um, Diana Solomon Glover is the uh, librettist. So um, it's been like a couple of uh, movements have been workshopped just the piano and vocal with chorus. And Everett McCorvey, the director of the American Spiritual Ensemble, um, is connected with the project. So we're hoping uh, to premiere the oratorio version of it in March. We'll see what happens. You know, there are some things that need to uh, be covered first but um that's an exciting project um, i'm looking forward to hearing it's already completed but i ha- it hasn't been premiered um, i wrote a short piano concerto um that will premiere in tacoma washington for their orchestra recital series um in this month i think i don't know i had a preliminary date i think of the 21st or something but um i just came from pittsburgh where i did um a sextet uh that i wrote for the renaissance uh, city winds um which was fun and then um Otherwise than that, I've, I've been asked to orchestrate some of my pieces, um, that, like some of my spirituals arrangements. Uh, and um, oh, what else? Let's see. I mean, I have some other things that I, I just want to do for fun, like that I, you know, like someone sent me, um, Shauna Shuri, uh, some, a singer who I met, very talented singer and, and poet, um, something that I'd like to do for piano and narrator. I think that would be fun. And... Um, Trying to think of what else. Oh, there's another project that um, is sort of in the hypothetical phase. Uh, a Jack Yeet Goldfinger, who is a um, librettist and playwright based in Philly, asked me to do something called Theranos based on Elizabeth Holmes' story. So that hasn't been begun yet, but you know, it's something that she asked me if I was interested in. And so the idea is to try to find someone who might be willing to uh, perform it so it could actually happen and not just be a lot of hours spent <laughs> never, never see the light of day I don't right, have right. to I don't have much time to do that sort of thing at this stage of my life so unless you know it's something shorter that's just for fun and some of right. those things have really you know done well when you know I have somebody and that's the thing I have after being around as long as I have and performed as many people as I have you know if I write something hey does this interest you you know do you think you might want to do this and you know if it's something short I've had people just say, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, I like that. And they like me, <laughs> so they're willing to give my music a chance. So that's handy. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Yeah. Because it, 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 a lot of, especially work nowadays, it's collaborative. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the way to do things, I, I really do believe. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit about uh, why do mini operas? What, what is that process like composing for, for an opera? Yeah, it was completely out of the blue, like a lot of this journey has been. Like, I didn't expect to be doing it. Um, I had written some art songs, and uh, for it was a pandemic video um, release. You know how people were putting concerts, yeah. So a singer who had sung these songs before the pandemic shut down um, wanted, thought they would be great for um, something with the AOT, uh, an opera theater, which was called something else back then. But anyway, that they were putting together. And so... Um, after the director of that heard those songs, she said, you know, they were doing this thing called the Decameron Opera Coalition. Uh, the Decameron being um, these stories that were written uh, during the Black Death pandemic back way back when. <laughs> so they thought, okay, you know, here yeah. we are in a pandemic, and so we're going to call it Decameron Opera Coalition. And some of the people had to... Uh, the You were supposed to choose stories from the Decameron, but she got dispensation to deviate these were all medium-sized opera companies and hers was the smallest and so she wanted to do something about domestic violence because during um the pandemic you know these people were locked together with their abusers and so um she had with, a f- with no one to see what was going on right exactly right. and not a good way to escape so um she got a first time librettist and me a first time opera composer and just said you know hey are you willing to give this a try? And it ha- can't be longer than 11 minutes. And I was like, 
okay, I'm doing other mm-hmm. stuff that I've never done before. Let's and they only had a budget for a piano and a violin. So I played the piano part and then sent it to this violinist, and it was all recorded remotely because they were based in Minnesota. And so that was the first opera with two singers. And um, so then after that one, um, another opera company that was involved in the first Decameron Coalition asked me if I would write for the second uh, production. And so then I had they had a slightly bigger budget, so I had four instruments and um, three singers. Um, and that one was a little bit longer. It was like 15 minutes. So... Um, that's, yeah, that's so interesting to me because an opera to me is like a whole two hour whole deal. Well, to fit it all down into eleven minutes. Well, because you know, I mean, some of the first job is a little brightest to making right. sure that they can tell the story in that amount of time. Yes, but I mean, I think that you know these opera shorts. Um, that's something I think that also came out of the pandemic. The idea of doing different um, staging things or making them more like music videos. No, this wasn't a music video, but you know, just like a mini episode of something. And yeah, I don't see any reason why opera needs to be that way. I mean, I, I now I'm uh, ha- have more association with Opera America after that, and then um, getting a grant for this um, the Boy from Troy, which is the John Lewis project. So I never expected that I would be doing things related to opera, but here I am. And um, you know, but but I the people in that world realize that they've had to evolve with the times. And so whether it's using more video or immersive experiences or telling different stories or trying to make it more accessible to the general public, you know, and so I think it's important. So, yeah. No, uh, it's great because, uh, you know, short content is king right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the better way to create, to create these masterpieces into more shorter content, well, there, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses to do mm. that. Well, I mean, there's, I think there's room for there's room for, for it, yeah. there's room for that, and there's room for the bigger things. I mean, I think as far as getting things performed, obviously there are some big companies that can afford to mount a big production, but especially if you're doing something new, I think it's um, almost easier to fit in uh, into more spaces if it's not a big thing that someone's gonna have to spend a lot of money to hire a lot of people to do. So, especially yeah. if you're just getting started, so you can always expand Absolutely. upon the work. Absolutely, yeah, and that's the thing too. You know, if you decide that you're gonna it was a great hit, and you want to make a larger production out of it, then, yeah. Go for it. Yep. So what are some techniques as a, as a composer or maybe as a pianist that you are still working on or you want to expand into? Um, as a composer, I am about to delve into writing for the harp, which mm. scared the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I don't understand how to play it. Um, and, you know, like, and I've played with every instrument in the orchestra, it doesn't mean that I could play any, any instrument in the orchestra. I used to play the violin for a number of years. So string playing, you know, it's not like I am. A, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. but I, yeah, it makes sense to me. And I, I played the flute briefly. Um, but, you know, I mean, but the harp, I it just seemed like an undiscovered country. So um, luckily, though, there's a lot of YouTube and I, I got this book. And um, so, you know, very breaks it down in all kinds of ways. And, you know, I just feel like, I want to be able to feel more comfortable writing for a lot of different instruments, even instruments that scare me. So that's one. Um, and apparently a lot of composers are scared by the harp. Just, really? Just, well, just the idea that you don't, you know, like, you know, you have to keep in mind the pedals, oh, the pedals and you know, how the pedals uh, and you can't. Yeah. So they can't, you know, just play a black key like a piano plays a black key. They got to change a pedal to move everything. And, you know, all these different things that quirks that I've learned from this book. So. The other thing that they say is, that, which is what I always do, is you know run the the thing by somebody who plays the instrument. And luckily, again, I've been around long enough that I know people who play almost every instrument. So and have been kind enough to you know, hey, does this part work? Um, but otherwise than that, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, writing for the full orchestra, I'm sort of dipping my toe into that, and it, mm. that scared me too. But but I realize it's just like having a lot of different paints in your paint box. You know, and a lot of really shades of the different colors and, and putting them all together is really kind of cool and exciting. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I Everything has been sort of a, a winding road of not knowing what's coming next. And I, if there's a gap, then I always there's some room for me to do something that I've always wanted to do just for fun. And, um, you know, I'm still performing. So that's takes my time I have a son who's on the autism spectrum so Mm. you know that requires my time so I don't have huge amounts of time to I guess come up with grand projects at the moment but when one drops into my lap I figure it out 
Well, uh, and that's the way you should. Yeah. That's the way it happens as a as a musician. A lot of a lot of small projects, and then every once in a while, you get that big project you work yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So as a you work at the Saint Episcopalian. Saint Thomas. Saint Thomas Episcopalian. Episcopalian. Mm-hmm. Episcopalian. It's okay. Is we it? get the gist. <laughs> we get the gist. <laughs> as a Christian. Uh huh. Where do you find yourself most in tune with God? Ah. Um. Well, I mean, I I will say that this is may sound cliche, but I mean, the music really does speak to me, and um, yeah, I mean, especially well, I can't say even especially when I'm just like noodling, um, because I I don't do that that often. Well, I do that um before church every um the prelude has become evolved into this thing where I'm just improvising on hymns. Mm for maybe 10 to 15 minutes. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. And it's it can really be, um, you know, almost like a, a form of uh, meditation for me, you know, and uh, prayer. But um, I don't know. I, I'm just constantly grateful, you know. I, I think of all the ways that things have gone. You know, everybody has had challenges, and I've certainly had my share of really big challenges. But, you know, I I've, I've been spared a lot of things and and I'm just constantly grateful that I'm able to have you know I have a roof over my head I have a car that works at least right now and <laughs> you know and I have opportunities you know to interact I feel loved by people and and uh, the community and and um, yeah it's just I, f- I feel like whatever the challenges have been that I have been sustained in them and yeah for that I'm, I'm grateful always so. So over all of these performances that you've had, I'm curious, what is one of the funniest or maybe worst things that ever happened <laughs> on stage? Um, funniest or worst? Well, um, I guess if I have to think of the worst, which I don't think people knew was going on, um, back when I was in my Juilliard days, I was sent to uh, do a tour in uh, Central America. They sent a pianist. I was the only person, like it was a doctoral student and they always chose a pianist because then they didn't have to pay, like the organization would pay for one person and then if it was a collaborative, then they had to pay, Juilliard had to pay. So they always sent a pianist. <laughs> I was the only pianist in the doctoral program at the time. So that was me. And um, we had this thing where it was in El Salvador and because there was a war going on, there was a curfew. <laughs> so I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and fly in. Was that? Yeah, it was El Salvador. And then. Um, Versus Honduras. Well, I didn't do. It? I didn't do Honduras. I did. I did El Salvador. I'm sorry. The war. The but... war. There was a war. It was way, way, way back. So oh, yeah. you know, the guy picked me. I said, "This is getting That's real." So interesting. It was yeah, state. Right. It was State Department thing. Bulletproof glass. There was a machine gun on the front seat. What? When he picked me up from the airport. Yeah, there was a curfew. You could only fly certain times. Okay. So I arrived there, and um, oh, was that Guatemala? Maybe it was Guatemala. I don't know. Anyway, so I was sleepy, <laughs> very sleepy. So I tried to take a nap. You know, I took a nap. I had to try out the the piano in this like old theater with bats flying over my head. I was like, ooh, those don't look like birds. And the guy, <laughs> people, the people standing out on the fr- on this on the street, soldiers on the street with like the ammo and a uh, gun. Nine yards. Yeah, I didn't hear any gunshots. But, but it was like, oh, this is real. But they said it was safe, so okay, here I am. But I was so tired, and I was doing the Bartok Sonata, Piano Sonata. If you guys listen to it, um, you know, I had it memorized. It wasn't that I didn't have it memorized, but I just, like, I got lost in the, um, was it the last movement? Yeah, there was just, I just could not figure out where. So I, I just noodled a bit, and then I was able to jump to the end, but I left out a chunk of the middle. Because I couldn't find it. <laughs> I couldn't find it. Now, I don't know how well-versed they were in Bartok, so maybe they didn't notice. But, um, yeah, that was a little scary. I mean, yeah, it was a little scary. I mean, I'd had um, before that, you know, when I was 17, I was in a major car accident, and I had a, a concussion. Like, I wrapped around a ten of, uh, slid off a highway and hit a telephone pole, and I had a, you know, fractured pelvis, and I had Ooh. a concussion. And so after that, I was just always a little afraid that I was going to forget things because, you know, and I don't think I've come to the conclusion my memory is no worse than a lot of my students who are young (laughs) have had that issue. But um, for a long time, playing from memory was really kind of scary. And in that situation where I didn't have enough sleep, 
and it was a challenging piece and everything was a little bit weird (laughs) couldn't find it so yeah I don't know if that was funny (laughs) well I mean it's it's a very real situation yeah Uh, yeah my mind is all the the military and the wars and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, having to memorize a piece and then all of a sudden, oh, it's gone. It was gone. Yeah, it was gone. But I mean, I found the end. You know, well, that's always great. That was the only the rest of the the rest of the concert. I yeah, that wasn't the last piece, so I was able to go on to whatever else. But probably completely freaked out for the rest of the concert. <laughs> but I survived. So well, and that just goes to show that. Even as a musician, you have to have your improv- improvisational skills up as well because I'm sure everyone forgets. I forget sometimes my pieces on the percussion. I just have to noodle around a bit so I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the main thing is that you just keep going. Just keep going and find it, you know, and that, that is a skill that can only be found out on, in the hard circumstances whether you can really do that. But, Absolutely. Yeah. And... And if you can't find it, just find a nice way to finish. Yeah, exactly. Well, now I use an iPad. I During mm. the um, pandemic, I did a recording uh, with LSO, some people from the LSO, including Doris, and uh, the Poulenc six Sextet, which is not something you're going to play from memory. And it's not something where there are always easy page turns. And, you know, it was pandemic, so we had these protocols. And so having a page turner, like I didn't have a family member who could turn the pages. So that's when I started using the foot pedal thing, which I was always afraid of. You know, but now I'm, I said, you know, I mean, Franz Liszt was the guy who said pianists had to play from memory. I see people, I saw Lang Lang playing a Bach prelude, like the first one in C major on T, on a YouTube video and in using music. And I was like, okay, well, oh, if, if he's, do doing, it, if he's yeah. doing that, you know, that piece, which I wouldn't think is hard to remember. There was just some pieces that I was recording that I was like, there's no way I'll remember these. It's just like, there's no way. I mean, if you listen to some of the stuff on, on that um, Soulscapes 2, that last recording, I mean, yeah, there's just some things I was like, there's, it's not going to happen. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to give myself the gift of being able to just sweat out the hard technical stuff and not have to sweat whether I'll remember it or not. Right. No, absolutely. It's already hard enough that if, you're, if, it's, if it's a lot of technical stuff, but then having to remember all the things you have to do. Well, because I'm, I'm well into middle age. That's the thing. So, <laughs> you know, that, you know, I'm, I'm giving myself now the grace. I said I went through my whole youth dealing with that whole memory thing. And um, now I'm, I'm just going to say, you know what? Deal with it. Hopefully you can still enjoy the music even if I've got music. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's like, it's, it's just, it's just a. It's a convention. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it, I. I don't care if you have music in front of you. I'd rather you have music in front of you just for that for that case in, you know, case in point. Yeah, right? if, as, as long as it can be expressed. And I think yeah. I used to feel that I was more engrossed in the music if it, if I didn't have music, and that's what you train to, mm. to believe. And, you know, I'd close my eyes and stuff like that. Um, but I don't know. I feel like... Um, you can have both. Yeah, I, f- I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm entered the, entering this period where I'm not pushing myself to do that anymore, and so far so good. <laughs> Well, Maria, yes. where can people find you at? Oh, okay. I've got a website. It's mariacorley.com. I'm on YouTube. Um, I have, you know, the YouTube channel. If you put in Maria Corley or Maria Thompson Corley, I'm on Instagram, as one is. I've got a Facebook, um, a composer, Maria Thompson composer page. Uh, I've got a Maria Thompson writer page, although I don't post too much on that. And that's probably enough information. <laughs> More than enough. <laughs> and I'll be sure to put some in the links below. Please be sure to check out Dr. Maria Thompson Corley. Uh, it's been a wonder and a, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. And my name is Corey Rosen. This has been the Story Podcast. You can find us at CoreyRosenProductions.com. That's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N Productions.com, where you can find out more about me and the, all the guests that I've had and some of the really cool opportunities that we got coming up, including the Songwriter Studio, where we grab three to four other people around the area and put them into this room and we challenge them to write a song within an hour. Ooh, that sounds fun. It is fun. <laughs> it, we had our first one this past Monday and I'm really happy with the results. So I'm really excited to go into that more. Otherwise, we have a uh, almost a full week of podcast episodes upcoming. Tomorrow we have Lodi Lodi. He's a rapper from the Harrisburg area and I'm excited to talk to him. Finally, this has been Almost six months into making that one. Uh, Ani May is coming over. She is a singer-songwriter from the Yorkish area. Uh, uh, Yorkish Lancashire. 
Uh, I can't remember which one. But she she does incredible jazz work, and I'm really excited to talk about uh, getting to that world again. We've got Debo, who is an amazing funk guy. He has just released his super villain, uh, super villain album, and he came to the CPMAs all dressed up as a super villain. So I'm really excited to a uh, very personable, very large personality, larger than life kind of dude. I'm very excited to talk to him. We got the Jess Zimmerman band coming back this Tuesday, so I'm excited to talk about them and a new album coming up. They just got their recording done in Nashville, so I'm really excited to talk to her about all of that. Then uh, Wednesday, we have Matt Friedman coming in, and he's a singer-songwriter from the area, so uh, as you can tell, there's a lot of yeah, <laughs> singer-songwriters in this area. I'm busy. very busy. Yeah. And then next Thursday, we have Mr. Motivation. He is a an urban hip-hop rapper who also goes around to schools and, and helps out with, with the youth in urban centers and helping them get on track and, and help help them get out of, you know, the the slob that can be urban living. Mm. So I'm really excited to talk about that with him. And otherwise, that's all we got for this upcoming week. As if, you know, that's all. That's a lot. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to stay tuned for that, please be sure to do so. My name is Corey Rosen. This has been a story podcast. Until next time, see you guys later.